Hello, everybody. I'm Bob Couture, host of Where the Twain Meet. Welcome to our series of chats and interviews that I hope will shed new light on the subject of dispute resolution, areas where our human competitive and cooperative impulses, the core elements of conflict, are melded together into alloys of behavior that may not always prove predictable. We'll look in places where you'd expect the subject to be examined, but also perhaps where you might not. Our agreements, truces, deals, legal judgments, alliances, bonds of love, victories, losses, even works of art, created by some magical alchemy? Or are there real axioms, proven methods, which guide us through the churn of conflict to meaningful resolution? I think about Rodney King's simple plea during the 1992 Los Angeles protest riots. Can we all get along? Can we all get along? That wasn't just a question. It was a proposition too. Is that proposition impossible to achieve or even ridiculous to seriously consider? Let's talk with folks who may tell us something that we don't know. And let's try to find more answers. Of course, like many good things in life, some of the remedies are probably in plain sight. But on this show, we'll do our best to probe ideas simple and complex and not look the other way. My first guest, Jim Haddo, is a partner at the Portland, Maine law firm, Petroselli Martin in Haddo. He's also an old friend. We've known each other since we were kids and discussed many things through the years, personal and professional, as old friends do. I've always been impressed by his honesty and earnestness. And he's a smart guy, too. When I first entered the field of labor negotiations many years ago, representing my musician colleagues in collective bargaining, Jim was an important source of support and advice in helping me establish footing in those early days. And I'm pleased to introduce him to you in this first episode. His perspectives on the framing of agreements and resolutions are practical and wise, in my opinion. But I leave that to your judgment. Hope you enjoy our discussion today about where the twain meet. Jim, welcome to the show. I'm really excited that you're my first guest. We've known each other for decades. We've shared many experiences. And here we are with this new venture. Once upon a time, many years ago, when I came to you for advice prior to my very first labor negotiation, you said to me, at the end of the day, you want to be able to establish yourself as a voice of reason in the negotiations. That's probably how you'll achieve your best results, Bob. And I've always found that to be good advice. And I was wondering if you find that to be good advice still and how you establish your voice in negotiations. Yes. In answer to the question, yes. It's an important goal, an important position to put yourself in. In terms of how it varies in some respects from situation to situation, but in the end, in every situation, it involves being very careful not to get too attached to your own arguments, remaining open to the possibility that information that's coming into you in the course of the proceeding, whatever it might be, could change your assessment of the situation. And overall, just maintaining a kind of detachment from the dispute and being able to reevaluate talk with all parties who are involved in a reasonable way, yielding the tendency to be very certain of your own position in favor of a little bit more uh, perspective. How do you see trust as part of the process of establishing that voice? Especially in the context of a negotiation, trust is absolutely essential to arriving at a resolution. 
in a negotiation in which the negotiating parties do not trust one another, it's near impossible to arrive at a negotiated resolution. However contentious any particular dispute might be, or however antagonistic the parties may be toward one another, if it's possible to find any scintilla of common ground, something that can begin the process of the parties having at least limited trust in each other, that's going to be the beginning of the path to a negotiated resolution. Even in the process of setting up the negotiation, being consistent, sticking to whatever commitments you might make as a party to show up at a certain time, to provide information that's accurate. Little things can be the beginning of building trust, even between parties who are extremely uh, antagonistic toward one another. But that is the key. Finding a way to build trust in those circumstances is really the only way to find a path to a resolution if it's going to be a negotiated resolution. One of the questions I have from my own experience, and also I think ultimately one of the themes of the conversations on this show, is a discussion about competitive and cooperative inclinations of the parties. It sounds to me like you have thoughts on the relationship between cooperative pieces and competitive pieces in the establishment of trust. In large measure, my practice is dominated by litigation. I try cases, I prepare cases to be tried. And in that context, I'm working within the adversarial system, which is the American jurisprudential model. You have lawyers on both sides. They advocate zealously on behalf of their clients. They work hard to build a body of information on which to base a representation of their clients, whether it's as a plaintiff prosecuting a claim or as a defendant defending a claim. So that model, I think, tends to lead people to think and lead lawyers to think that the best way to resolve a dispute is to go at it hammer and tongs and to wage all out war. And the winner is the person who has waged war most effectively. In my experience, that is not true. That's not the best way to arrive at an outcome, even if it's a litigated outcome. Instead, there are certainly places where conflict is important and you have to be prepared to engage in a certain amount of conflict in a litigation setting. But much more broadly, being able to function in an environment of what I would be inclined to call careful cooperation or vigilant cooperation, that's the way to get to a resolution, whether it's going to be a negotiated resolution or, or a litigated resolution in the end, that is most nearly just given all of the factors at play. As an example, in civil litigation, a big part of what happens before you actually get to trial is that the parties are required to exchange information during what's called the discovery process. There's not a lot of room for legitimate argument about what is and what isn't subject to discovery. And so that's gonna generate a lot of fighting with or without the assistance of a judge about what's gonna turn up, what's gonna be disclosed. And in the end, the result is pretty nearly always a foregone conclusion. So it's a waste of time to proceed that way. And no one ultimately benefits from it. For that reason, taking a more cooperative approach to that kind of situation, in other words, I know and the opposing lawyer knows that certain kinds of information are just going to have to be disclosed. And in fact, from my perspective, depending on what the circumstances are, I might very well want to make sure that information I have in my possession gets disclosed. It might be to my advantage. So taking a cooperative approach, handing over information that everybody knows has got to be handed over anyway, rather than fighting about it. That's one of those, not even small things, sort of 
fairly large things that parties, lawyers can do with one another that begins to establish a kind of trust relationship around the dispute, whatever it might be. We disagree about how this case ought to come out, but we believe that each of us, that the other is behaving in good faith. We believe that everyone involved is complying with their obligations under the law. If you're able to establish that kind of trust, fulfilling your obligations under the law, and although there may be a legitimate disagreement about the outcome, we believe that everyone is being forthright, that can go a long way toward getting to a resolution. So there are these elements in the litigation process that are either conflict or cooperation, but they're not necessarily at odds with each other. In fact, they may very well be working symbiotically, if you will, to achieve a more just result. I've heard a comment that says something like, the process of arriving at an agreement moves at the speed of trust. And I'm wondering, are there human affects, ways of communicating that keep you more on that path, the path of trust? And I know that in this process, this competitive cooperative process, I'm guessing you have to be careful not to roll over. Absolutely. As a young lawyer, one of the hardest things for me to learn was how to be collegial with other lawyers and at the same time, keep a firm position, not yield. So it has to be possible, for example, to say to another lawyer, I understand how you arrive at the position you arrive at. We're just going to have to leave that dispute for resolution a different day whether that's going to be by a judge or by one of us persuading the other. But for now, we're not in agreement and we'll work on something else. Part of it is affect, I think, as you suggest, using words to express respect for understanding of your opponent. Part of it is also just being calm, honestly, <laughs> not being a fire-breathing antagonistic person. There are simple things like, I know there are lawyers I can call to talk about a case and we can have a frank conversation and I don't have to worry that the lawyer is going to take some snippet of the conversation we had and send it back to me in an email or a letter to try to push a point that they want to make. There are other lawyers who will do that. And so I have to be careful in talking with them. I can't be as frank in my assessment of my own case. But that kind of mutual respect where you can have a conversation with an opponent and without giving up anything in terms of your obligation to your client, you can help move a case forward just because there's a certain amount of mutual respect. You can have a frank conversation and you don't have to worry about being exploited. A lot of elements in how trust gets built in the context of my work anyway. It's partly the words, it's partly how they're spoken. You work with the same people a certain number of times and just by virtue of the fact that you've gradually trusted them a little bit more and a little bit more over time and each time they have proved worthy of that trust, you develop trust relationships with people. It's pretty rare that you just say, okay, well, I'm just going to be 100% trusting without any evidence that that's justified. But it always happens that it has to start someplace. You have to trust at least a little bit without any evidence to begin with in order to test the water and see if there is trustworthiness. The hard part is deciding to be the person who breaks that ice. Be the first one to stick your neck out even a little bit in the hope that it will turn out that the person you're sticking your neck out to is not going to chop it off. Are there instances where plain old forcing tactics work? I'd like to say no, but that's not true. Yes, there are. It has been rare you know, that that's been ultimately the only successful strategy. But I can't honestly say it hasn't happened. And I can't honestly say there haven't been cases where I arrived at a point where I thought there was no other choice. And there are instances where there just isn't any trust at all. 
and one party or both is just intransigent. And there's a clear legal rule that favors one or the other. When that's the case, from my professional standpoint, my obligation, if I represent the party with the legal right that's not being honored, is to just force the issue. Sometimes that's the only way to go. But as I said, almost always, everybody involved in a case has at least a little bit of rational self-interest. That almost always results in the end result being negotiable in some way. Or even if not negotiable, at least everybody can agree that it should be submitted to a neutral decision maker without rancor. And it's really only the very small minority of cases where you just have to bring the hammer down. I'm curious to how that relates to trust. And I'm imagining that bringing down the hammer within the context of a trusting relationship has more meaning. It may also invite speculation as to whether the other party is bluffing or not. Sure. You don't ever actually know if someone's bluffing until you call the bluff. And in a way, bringing the hammer down is calling the bluff. This is why there are still a substantial number of civil cases that settle on the courthouse steps, as the saying goes. People think they've arrived at a point where they have no choice except to force the issue. So they put process in motion to force the issue. And at the last possible moment before the issue is forced, the other side yields enough, maybe not 100%, but yields enough to make it possible to resolve the case. Again, that does require a certain amount of trust between the parties, settling even at that point. There's an agreed settlement. There are elements of trust that have to be part of it because one thing, you're in a scenario where you are scheduled to go to trial. You've picked a jury, are scheduled to start the opening statements two hours from now, and the other side comes to you and says, okay, we give up, we'll settle this on terms that are okay with you. Even then, you have to trust that they're actually going to do what they say they're going to do. There are all kinds of structural elements built around a situation like that intended to make it difficult for a party to back out after they've committed. But difficult isn't impossible. Even at that point, if you say, okay, I'm going to settle the case and you let the judge know and the judge discharges the jury, you're doing that on trust. And part of the trust is trust in the other side to behave the way they're supposed to behave. And part of the trust is in the legal system. You have to trust that if the other side doesn't behave, that somehow or other the legal system will provide you with an appropriate remedy so that you haven't just given up your right to go to trial for nothing. You know, trust is through and through that process. What's a common myth about the law, a mistaken view of your profession? I think the most common mistaken view that I come across generally is the idea that the job of a lawyer is to somehow manipulate the law or the legal process for the benefit of their clients. First of all, that is not consistent with the professional responsibility of lawyers. Our job is not to try to pretend or to try to argue that the law is something it isn't just to benefit a client. We have enforceable professional obligations regarding candor to tribunals, to courts and other tribunals, regarding candor to opposing lawyers and to our clients. The idea that we manipulate, that we misrepresent in a way that's sly and devious. I'm certain there are lawyers who actually do that, but if there are, they are violating their own professional responsibilities to the court and to everybody. I think that's a common misconception that's reinforced by lawyers in popular culture, in the media. Inevitably, when you see lawyers in the media, they are people who are seeking out the publicity for some reason. And that's a kind of a self-selecting group. They're not representative of the profession as a whole in any meaningful way. But when you see these folks who have shown up in the wake of the Trump administration who are essentially media figures who have law degrees and who ultimately shown to be 
pretty fundamentally dishonest. The one thing you'll see is they all wind up getting disciplined in some way by the licensing authorities for lawyers because they're violating their responsibilities. That's a, a misconception I, I would like to see go away, but I don't think it's going to anytime soon. The other thing that I think is a very common misconception that I don't see all that much in my day-to-day -day life because I don't practice in the criminal arena, but that I do see and hear about when I'm just talking with people in a social setting, non-lawyers, is the idea that the criminal justice system is skewed to favor criminals and that somehow it's a common occurrence for guilty people to be released without any consequence based on legal technicalities. I think first it's important to understand that what people often refer to as legal technicalities are actually important constitutional rights that protect far more innocent people than guilty people. That's the first part of that misconception that I think it would be important for people to reevaluate. And the second part of the misconception that's important for people to reevaluate is that the actual number of people who are accused of crimes and somehow or other wind up being acquitted because of some legal principle that causes them to be acquitted despite being guilty, that number is vanishingly small really tiny. Unless we are going to subscribe to a criminal justice system that puts an awful lot of innocent people in jail, we're going to have to tolerate a certain amount of mistaken acquittal. Our system is designed specifically to the extent possible to err on the side of a few guilty people going free rather than a large number of innocent people being punished. The system errs on both sides, as we know. People who are innocent do get convicted, do wind up serving long, sometimes long prison sentences. That happens very, very rarely. So there are errors on both sides, but certainly the criminal justice system is not porous to the extent that a bunch of criminals are being allowed to go back out on the street without having been tried and convicted and having served whatever time they're sentenced to. How do these misconceptions influence or affect how you do your job? Lawyers are all officers of the court and we all are responsible for the image of the profession in the popular mind, the way these misconceptions affect the way I practice is that it makes me all that much more attuned to the situations in my practice where someone might look at something that I'm doing and misunderstand, maybe perceive something I'm doing as sly or devious or dishonest. And it causes me to take a second look at anything that gives even the impression of manipulation of the system, because that's not what we are charged with doing as lawyers. I think it's really, really important for all lawyers to both fulfill our obligations to our clients, which is to say to represent them competently zealously even at times, but also to respect the integrity of the system, the legal system, to contribute to the integrity of the legal system, and to contribute to the public confidence in the courts and the legal system. Because at bottom, a society cannot function unless the vast majority of people believe that the legal system works. And it has to work. Both things have to be true. My part of that is to do my work in such a way as to give anyone who has occasion to look at it confidence that the legal system does work the way it's supposed to. That's part of what keeps a civil society moving, keeps it civil. I'm thinking about the ability to bring a lot of information into play when a case is being evaluated or going through the legal system. I'm guessing that sometimes you participate in mediation as well, which is probably different than that adversarial model of depositions, etc. If you were to compare the two with the idea of gaining the most information that could eventually be part of determining an agreement, do you see advantages for one over the other? Yes, 
And let me reframe a little bit the juxtaposition of mediation versus trial. In almost all of my cases, there's a certain amount of discovery that takes place before a mediation. Again, the theory behind the adversarial process is when you have these two opposing parties, each of whom is aggressively seeking information from the other, and then bringing that information to bear in an adversarial setting, that dynamic makes it likely that the best information, the most information, is going to be brought into the decision-making process and therefore the ultimate decision-maker, presumably that's going to be a judge in the initial version of this model, will be able to make the decision based on the best available information. And as it plays out now in most litigated matters, there is a certain period of time during which the parties do some discovery. They do some of that exchanging of information before the case goes into mediation. And the reason for that is as a lawyer, you don't always have enough information to advise your client responsibly about what would be a reasonable settlement until you have figured out a little bit more about what the other side's case involves. What do they have for information? So generally speaking, there's a certain amount of discovery that happens before mediation. If a client is reluctant to mediate, the first thing I tell them is you don't have any choice because it's mandatory. <laughs> but the second thing I tell them is, look, the worst thing that happens here is you get some free discovery because what happens in mediation is you learn things in the course of the mediation about the other side's case because they're trying to argue to the mediator who's then trying to argue to you about why you should shift your position in the direction of the opponent. The same is happening in reverse in the other room. The mediator is saying to the other side all the reasons why they should change their position to get closer to you. In both instances, whether you're going to mediation or whether you're going to trial, Information is currency. Information acquired either through discovery or through the communication that happens in the mediation process. That's what the ultimate decision to settle or not settle or the decision of the judge ultimately on who wins and who loses is based. As to which is better, it depends, I guess, on how you measure better. But what I can say is I have had clients who felt I think, less than completely satisfied with a resolution that was achieved through mediation, but not very many. And I've had plenty of clients who were very dissatisfied with an adjudicated resolution. You'll often hear from mediators, the statistics, the surveys that have been done show that parties who resolve their cases through mediation are much more satisfied with the resolution than parties who go all the way to trial. Anecdotally, my experience supports that. The other thing that mediators often say, which is really true and important and very much related to that first thing, is that in mediation, the parties are actually in control of the resolution. They remain in control of the resolution all the way to the end. If the case is resolved in mediation. That is not true in litigation. If they yield control to a decision maker, a judge, they don't have any say in the decision making, you know, who wins, who loses, what the result is. In almost all civil litigation, if parties arrive at a resolution through mediation, that is a much preferable mechanism for dispute resolution. Litigation is an extremely blunt instrument. It does not cut finely. And so at the end of the day, in a trial, somebody wins and somebody loses, or sometimes, in a sense, everybody loses. It is never the case that in a trial, everybody wins. Not at all. Whereas, depending upon how you look at it, in many mediations, maybe not everybody comes away feeling like they've won, but the end resolution is almost always better, in some sense, at least, for everybody involved than an adjudicated resolution. Have you ever been party to what you would term a successful agreement or verdict that surprised you? Yes, absolutely. I have been involved in mediations in which I came into them convinced that there were no terms on which the case could settle, and yet it did. It's amazing how effective the mediation process can be in cases where 
you have every reason to think it just won't work. I've learned over the years that sometimes cases that involve what I think of as a lot of money, what you would think of as a big case, sometimes those cases are actually easier to settle than the cases that involve relatively small amounts of money or relatively little value. And I think that's in part because usually the cases that involve a lot of money are among pretty sophisticated commercial parties. And so they tend to be more dispassionate in the way that they approach trying to resolve disputes. Whereas cases that involve relatively small amounts of money often are commenced in the first instance, not because of the money, but because parties are antagonistic toward one another and feel aggrieved. And it's harder sometimes to solve the problem of a party feeling aggrieved than it is to cause parties who are just making a business decision to agree to accept a smaller remedy in the interest of moving on. Then you might hear the comment, it's not really the money, it's the principle. Yeah, I have heard that a number of times and it's almost never true. <laughs> it's almost always about at least some amount of money. And I'm always very wary of that. A client who comes to me with a $50,000 dispute and I say, look, I need you to understand that if you're going to pay me by the hour to take this case and it goes all the way to trial, you are going to spend more than what's at stake. And you're not going to get it back because in the vast majority of cases in the US, even if you win, you don't get your attorney's fees back. Let's be clear up front. If we're going to take this all the way to trial, it's going to cost you more than the amount that's at stake. If the client then says to me, I don't care. It's a matter of principle. I want to pursue it anyway. I'm very suspicious about that. <laughs> My experience over the years has been that when the client gets about $20,000 into it, in attorney's fees, the client starts to say, how come this is costing so much money? Going back and saying, look, we talked about this at the beginning. I warned you this was going to happen. Doesn't seem to matter. What tends to happen is whatever it was that caused the client to be aggrieved to begin with, the client then begins to feel aggrieved by the client's own lawyer because the thing isn't resolving. The whole, it's not the money, it's the principal thing. Every once in a while that might be true, but most of the time it isn't. And so I have gotten to the point now where I just say to people, look, if there's less than a certain amount of controversy, I understand, but I'm not gonna handle that for you because in my professional judgment, it is not worth your while to pursue it for that amount in controversy. Going back to the case that settles, that surprises you, are you able to draw connections among those? What happened in there? And is there a pattern to those amazing agreements that occur? I've never discerned a particular pattern. Certainly one element that has to be common through all of the cases is that one of the parties, sometimes more than one of the parties, depending on how many there are in the case, has to have substantially reevaluated their position in the mediation. Some information that's coming to them in the course of the mediation causes a fairly radical readjustment in their assessment of the case. Back to part of what I was saying at the beginning in response to your very first question, which is about being the voice of reason in the negotiation. Because if I'm representing a party coming into a mediation or any negotiation for that matter, but a mediation and the party and I have talked about the case as we see it and we think we understand what the settlement value of the case is and we go into the mediation with that orientation or that perspective. And then in the course of the mediation, either something that we hear from the other side or something from the mediator really casts into doubt some important element of what we have thought about the case. I, as the lawyer, have to be able to say to my client, you know what, I know we thought X, but based on what we're hearing now, it sounds like we might have been wrong about that. And if we are, then we really need to reevaluate our position. In that instance, the lawyer being the voice of reason to the client can really help move the negotiation. And I think that's got to be an important part of each of those cases that surprised me. Either something that came to me and my client changed our position or something that we communicated through the mediator was heard on the other side 
and caused a reevaluation. So maybe that's the common thread. First, there's information coming into the mediation that's new to someone. And second, there's someone involved in the negotiation that's prepared to hear and evaluate that information, even if it runs against a fairly firmly held view of the case. In the law, it's a trap to allow yourself to become certain of anything because you never have perfect information, ever. That's not possible. To the extent that you ever feel certain of anything, in essence, you're saying, I have perfect information and I'm basing my view on that perfect information. It's just a fallacy. If you're going to be good at this work, you have to fight the urge to be certain. You have to develop conviction and you have to have the courage of those convictions and, and be able to act on them. You have to be decisive, but you also have to have a sufficiently open mind. You have to be sufficiently prepared to change your views, your convictions even, so that if really contrary information comes forward, you have to be able to hear it. You have to be able to integrate it into your decision-making process and you have to change tact if that's what that information demands. And the legal system itself is always contemplating the idea of reasonable doubt. Absolutely. Yeah. The idea of doubt is really through and through at every level. The reasonable doubt concept is one that's familiar in the context of criminal justice, because if there is reasonable doubt as to the guilt of a criminal defendant, then that criminal defendant must be acquitted. On the civil side, the burden of proof on a plaintiff is not beyond a reasonable doubt. It's only by a preponderance of the evidence. But again, to what degree do you have to be persuaded before you can make a decision? And the legal system doesn't even recognize 100% certainty as a degree of persuasion. It doesn't exist. It's always lesser degrees. Well, on the civil side, as I said, it's the preponderance of the evidence, which really means slightly more likely than not. That's the standard. And then beyond a reasonable doubt, for obvious reasons, is the criminal standard because what's at stake there is liberty, personal liberty. That's a much higher bar, but it's still not beyond any doubt. That's not a standard that exists anywhere in the law. You're absolutely right. There's a real baked in awareness in the legal system that perfect knowledge is not possible. Certainty is not a degree of persuasion that the law recognizes. And in fact, it's perilous to believe that certainty is actually possible in the real sense. What aspect of the legal process inspires you the most? The independence of the courts when it actually plays out. The fact that the courts are not answerable to either the legislative branch or the executive branch in individual decision making. That's such a crucial element of the whole system of governance and laws. It is what establishes checks on the power of the legislative and executive branches at times when those checks are absolutely crucial. That is the element of the judicial system that I think is most inspiring. It's the final layer of protection against threats to democracy. That's very profound. <laughs> and really important. It's why when courts are perceived to be acting as political organizations, political actors, it's very dangerous, very bad for the way that the democracy is perceived because the courts shouldn't be political agents. If they are, that role check or balance against the abuse of power by the other branches of government is very seriously diminished and it's perceived to be diminished, which is almost as bad. The other thing that I think is really kind of inspiring about the judicial system, the American judicial system, is that in most instances, people who have real need of access to justice are able to get access to justice. I think the judicial system still struggles, the legal system still struggles to make sure that that's true. And it's more true on the criminal side than it is on the civil side. But even with those flaws, the extent to which ordinary people do have access to the court system for dispute resolution, for protection of their rights, for a wide array of legal remedies, it's inspiring.
And it's important that that be not only maintained, but expanded. And the fact that lawyers in particular support those efforts, both by volunteering to represent clients pro bono and by supporting financially the legal aid organization, that's a really important and inspiring element as well. What does it feel like to you as a lawyer when you read the kind of news we've been seeing around the Supreme Court? It's incredibly disappointing to see courts act in a way that seems overtly political. And in my view, talking about the U.S. Supreme Court in particular, there has been real reason to be concerned about the legitimacy of the U.S. Supreme Court ever since it took up Bush versus Gore and resolved what was, in essence, a local voting question in what looked like an effort to seal a political victory for a particular candidate. Whether that was what was going on or not doesn't really matter in that case as much as the fact that, first of all, the U.S. Supreme Court did not have to intervene. There was no requirement that it intervene. It chose to intervene at a time when there was no indication that the local authorities were incapable of resolving the dispute. And there was a clear, very high profile consequence political consequence to its decision. That was a place where a prudent court should have, in my opinion, abstained, should have stepped back and let the process play out. Starting there, I think, and running right through to the controversy that's currently engulfing the court about ethics, there's been a lot of reason to be concerned about how the court's perceived and its legitimacy. More broadly, I think we are seeing what certainly looked to me like trial court decisions, primarily federal trial court decisions that are the result more of an individual judge's ideology than any legitimate legal argument that could be made. And that is extremely troublesome. It's a consequence of the conscious effort on the part of politicians to place ideologues on the bench. I'm fortunate because I practice in a series of state and federal courts where I feel confident that the judges who sit are not ideologues. They are servants of the law and they may be wrong at times. They may make mistakes. They may even be bad judges in some objective sense, some of them, although not many, but they're not political ideologues. In my day-to-day -day life, I don't come across that but I pay enough attention to the news to see it and to deplore it. Fortunately, so far, it seems as though the availability of appeals in the federal courts has kept some semblance of legal analysis in the fore. Some of the more extreme federal trial court decisions that I would say were almost certainly political and not legal decisions have been reversed pretty quickly by the federal circuit court that had appellate jurisdiction over whatever trial judge issued the decision. It's not a perfect system, but so far the system seems to be weeding out at least the very worst of those kinds of actions. Who knows how it'll end up. Have you been involved with a case where you saw a person that was having difficulty accessing the law because of class or money, someone that was not being covered in this system and came to your attention? Yes, uh, certainly that has happened. And more than once, in some instances, they were people who ultimately became my clients being represented on a pro bono basis. Sometimes they were people who, in the end, didn't really get the kind of access to the system that they probably should have been able to get. The one that comes most readily to mind is a person who came to the U.S. from Vietnam right after the Vietnam War as a partner to a U.S. military a soldier. After coming to the U.S., the relationship with the soldier ended. This person who ultimately became my client had a very difficult time, never really got very comfortable 
living in the U.S. by the time that I met them, uh, didn't speak English fluently, was disadvantaged in many ways, including financially. And to make matters worse, had been exploited sexually by a lawyer here in Maine, as a consequence of which that lawyer had been disbarred. The lawyer then sued the person who ultimately became my client in federal court, claiming he had been disbarred because of fraud, which was very obviously not the case. I ultimately ended up taking that case on a pro bono basis with another lawyer in the firm, and we had a jury trial in federal court. In the end, my client won, not only in the sense that the jury didn't believe there was any fraud and rendered a verdict against the disbarred lawyer, but also the jury rendered a verdict in my client's favor against the lawyer. We didn't ask for any damages, just asked that the jury find that the lawyer had committed malpractice, essentially. We knew that the disbarred lawyer didn't have any money and didn't have any insurance, so there was no point in trying to collect money. That was a situation in which not only did that client suffer at the hands of this lawyer because of his exploitation of her, she was a vulnerable person to begin with. He then exploited her. She then had the courage to participate in the process by which the lawyer was disbarred and then ended up on the wrong end of a federal lawsuit as a result of that. She would never have been able to afford to hire a lawyer to defend her in that federal lawsuit. That was certainly a circumstance in which the system didn't have a ready way for her to be represented unless someone volunteered. There is a formal organization in Maine that acts as a clearinghouse for those kinds of cases. And she had come through that clearinghouse, which is how I wound up uh, volunteering to represent her. That certainly is the example that stands out most in my mind. There are disputes that involve amounts of money that are really important to the people who are involved in the dispute, but that just aren't enough to make it worthwhile. If somebody comes to me because they've got a $40,000 dispute with their contractor, I really have to tell them, look, you can't afford to litigate this. You just can't. It will cost more to litigate it than there is at issue. As I said, there are some rare occasions when there's the opportunity maybe to get your attorney's fees back if you win, but it's never good to count on that. And knowing that you're going to spend tens of thousands of dollars before you ever see a dime back, and you may never see a dime back, it just makes it so that there are a lot of cases where the system doesn't have a way to make it affordable for people to get a remedy. On the civil side, at least, that's probably the greatest failing of the American judicial system right now. These are folks who don't qualify for legal aid. They're not in that band of indigency where they can't afford a lawyer. They could at least theoretically afford a lawyer, but the cost of the process makes it prohibitively expensive to try to get back what they're really legally entitled to have, it's not worth it. So what are the remedies for situations where wealthy individuals are in a place to leverage the law simply by the fact that they can litigate? Yeah. And the kind of short answer is that a lot of times there really isn't a workaround. Sometimes there can be. It kind of depends on how the case comes about who's the plaintiff, who's the defendant, who has insurance, who doesn't have insurance. Is there some fee-shifting contract that gives the victim a little bit more of a toehold? There are some circumstances that tend to bring the playing field a little bit closer to level. The fact of the matter is that a well-heeled litigant can almost always outlast a less well-heeled litigant. Unfortunately, there isn't a universal fix for that disparity. When it comes to civil litigation, with a very small number of exceptions, it's about money. Somebody who has a lot can do a lot of damage to someone who doesn't, even if the law is on the side of the disadvantaged litigant. It's interesting because in some ways, if you're on the wrong side of a lawsuit and you have no money, so you qualify for legal aid, you're in a better position than if you're on the wrong side of a lawsuit and you have some money, but not as much as the other side.
folks who are disadvantaged by language issues, cultural issues, are there ways that the justice system mistakes the virtues of their arguments because of cultural incongruities, if we were to say that the justice system has a culture? It's a big question because there are so many different elements of the justice system, and some of them are more culturally sensitive than others. The degree of cultural sensitivity probably varies widely from the federal government to state government, from state to state, from federal agency to federal agency, from state agency to state agency. So there's a lot there. I'm aware, very much aware of reported decisions of high courts, both state and federal, that take into account to some degree cultural differences in evaluating conduct from either a criminal justice or child protective perspective. That's where those things tend to crop up most directly. So for example, from a child protective perspective, a family recently immigrated from Sudan might have some cultural practices around child rearing that would be considered problematic in the culture in which they now find themselves. Sometimes to the point where it could cause an agency like Child Protective Services to swoop in and take some action. What the courts have done historically is look at those situations and allow some leeway to reflect cultural differences, but not to erode substantially the protections that are in place that the state has decided are essential for protecting the welfare of children. That kind of cultural difference, there's a certain amount of flexibility in the judicial system, but not a lot. And certainly on the criminal justice side, there's really not a lot of room. Is there a case you're most proud of, most memorable to you? I think the most objectively good was the case that I described earlier involving the woman who had been exploited by the subsequently disbarred lawyer. That was very uh, gratifying to be able to reach that result and to be able to, at least to some extent, restore my client's faith in the legal profession and the justice system. I can't say that it wiped away all of the prior bad experience, but at least it gave her a reason to trust, again, to some degree at least, in the legal profession and, and the justice system. So that really stands out to me. What's the most important strength, in your opinion, that a lawyer brings to the job? Integrity. No question about that, in my mind anyway. But I think a very close second is empathy. And that, to me, means not just empathy for your own client, not just empathy for the opposing party, but for your colleagues, for the people you practice with, the judges, the staff in the court system, Everything about what we do as lawyers is very high stress. Everyone involved in the system feels that every day, if not every minute of every day. They work very hard. They're really trying to do the right thing by and large. Having a little bit of empathy. If some situation with an opposing lawyer or with a court clerk or somebody else starts to feel irritating, or if as a lawyer you start feeling as though someone is doing you wrong, it's really good to stop and take a breath, give some consideration to what might be happening on the other side of that interaction behind the scenes. The whole process doesn't have to be as contentious as it sometimes gets to be. No one really benefits from it being that contentious. And I think having some empathy really reduces the risk that the adversarial element is going to just swallow up everything else in the process. How did the time in which you grew up affect who you became <laughs> or who you have become? I graduated from high school in 1977, graduated from law school in 86. I think those formative years that I was in high school and then college and even law school to some degree, there was a lot really going on socially in the, in the country as a whole, in the world as a whole. The era after the 1960s, as the culture was processing, digesting all of that turmoil, especially the late 1960s, there was a lot that was important that came about. And one of the things that probably made the most difference to me 
in my development was the idea that society was generally better when it was more tolerant. And that comes about primarily when more people are more emotionally intelligent. In a very particular way, for me as a person growing into manhood, I was very much aware that the primary impediment to emotional intelligence, at least in my generation, was the traditional model of masculinity, which eschewed all attention to the emotions other than anger. It became really important to me individually to try to become more emotionally intelligent, to learn more about my own emotional interior and to try to be sensitive to the people around me in those ways. That's an ongoing process, I have to say. That's something I think about almost every day still and something that I see as a, a continuing effort on my part. The men who were my antecedents, my father, the people in his generation offered pretty much nothing in the way of a model for that new way of being a man, for lack of a better phrase. Uh, and so I felt as though I was making it up as I went along. And I've definitely gotten it wrong and had to reorient myself a number of times. Um, and I think that's still happening. In terms of the cultural medium in which I grew up, I think that's probably the single most significant factor for me, how I came about doing what I do and being who I am. And I can see now both in my personal life and in my professional life, I see young men who are so far ahead of where I was when I was their ages in terms of having emotional intelligence, having the capacity to contribute to the culture in that way. And I think that's all to the good. It's changing the world in a good way. Going back to that conversation about competitive and cooperative inclinations, is it fair to connect certain emotions with each? I certainly think so. The competitive inclinations, I think of as being adversarial. They're very pro-conflict in a way. And I think that it's hard to be competitive, perpetually in conflict, adversarial, without that carrying a certain amount of anger. Maybe not anger, but some version of anger. It's hard to sustain long-term, exclusively competitive or adversarial relationship without there being an element of anger in the relationship. I do think that if the relationship has elements of both competition and cooperation, I don't think that anger has to be part of it in that circumstance. You can be willing to accept a certain amount of conflict without it being necessarily an angry kind of conflict. And that I think does require a certain amount of cooperation, which in turn, to my way of thinking, at least from an emotional perspective, that involves empathy, understanding, willingness to listen to the other side, receptiveness. When they're combined, when there's a certain amount of conflict combined with cooperation in the same relationship, I think the worst sort of edges come off. If you're so committed to cooperation that it becomes appeasement and conflict avoidance, that's unhealthy. If you're so committed to competition and conflict that it's just angry, then that's not healthy. If you're willing to allow the two to overlap, I think you lose the negative elements and it becomes much more productive ultimately. Has gender made a difference in the way the profession behaves itself around competition and cooperation? When I graduated from law school in 86, the number of men and women graduating from law school in the U.S. was close to even, but fewer women were practicing, say, five years out, 10 years out. So it was still really male-dominated from the mid-80s through the mid-90s, let's say. And that's less true now. More women are litigators. That's another change that's happened during my time practicing law. There were very few women who were doing either civil or criminal litigation when I first started practicing, and now very common. I think having women much more active in the practice of law has definitely changed the practice of law in a number of ways. 
but not necessarily in exactly the ways that somebody might have guessed in advance. I think for a long time, it was just really difficult for women to be in the profession. I mean, there are a number of studies, including some relatively recently in Maine, that show that misogyny, bad treatment of women who are lawyers by men, judges and lawyers, is still common, still happens. Male lawyers, essentially refusing to acknowledge female lawyers in the room. Male lawyers uh, making inappropriate sexual comments to their female colleagues. Stuff you can't even believe is still going on is still going on. But on the upside, there's more attention being brought to it. In Maine, for example, uh, there was a recent change in the rules of professional responsibility so that now lawyers in Maine are required to have a certain number of continuing education hours that address harassment and discrimination every year. There are changes for the better that are happening, and some of those changes certainly are because there are more women in the profession and they are more able, with the help of allies, to bring these issues to the fore and to get the court system and the bar to acknowledge that there's a problem and to take action to try to address it. So that's all very good. A different kind of change, I think, is partly to do with more women in the profession, but also partly just to do with the difference in what people in the generation coming into the profession now expect from the profession, men and women. They expect to have better work-life balance. They expect a more diverse workplace, whether it's by gender, race, whatever. They expect a more diverse workplace. They expect not to be, for lack of a better term, hazed, which, you know, in a lot of professions, that's in effect how new practitioners have been treated, certainly up through our generation. And that's all changed, or it's changing, all for the better. As I said, part of it is that there are more women in the profession, but part of it is just, I think, society's changing generally, and that's not a bad thing at all. If you are able to give your 20-year-old self advice, what would that be? I wasn't very good at taking advice when I was 20, so I'm not sure it would have mattered if I could talk to myself at that age. I would advise to be more patient and to be less sure of myself. I made a lot of decisions when I was in that age range based on really almost nothing because I was so sure that I knew the answers to a lot of questions when I really didn't. And I was in a big hurry to do just about everything at that point in my life. That did not serve me well. I think those two things, if I could persuade myself of anything, that's what it would be. With that, what's the most important lesson you learned in your career? I would have to say that the most important lesson I've learned is that I don't have to sacrifice compassion or integrity in order to be an effective advocate for my clients. I can have all of those things. And in fact, it makes me a better advocate for my client if I act with compassion and integrity. Jim, thanks so much for this interview. It's really a pleasure. It's been my pleasure. Thanks. I hope we do this again. I'll look forward to that. Thank you for joining us in this episode of Where the Twain Meet. And please check out future programming at wherethetwainmeet.com. Meanwhile, take good care. See you soon.